Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I'm Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Illinois, we're going to get a chance to talk again. It's not going to be about people foolish enough to register firearms after the statutory deadline. No, instead, we're going to be talking about the big battle royale going with your assault weapon ban and multiple petitions to the United States Supreme Court for review. Now the state of Illinois has started responding and I got to tell you every now and then I need a little extra motivation. Why do I do what I do? Well I do what I do because I hate state governments that hate its citizens. In Illinois that's what you are struggling with. Don't believe me? I'm going to share with you today what your attorney general is saying to the United States Supreme Court as to why they should just leave your assault weapon bans alone and allow you to continue to live under the iron curtain of this particular state administration. So today, let's spend a few minutes, let's go through the brief and let's talk about Illinois to the Supreme Court, butt out of our gun bans. Okay, before we get going too far down the road, we're going down. Proud to announce that this video is being brought to you by Right to Bear. That's right, legal protection for self-protection. Listen, good lawyers aren't cheap. Cheap lawyers aren't good. You're not truly prepared unless you have Right to Bear back you. You will always get an attorney answered hotline, so you will always have a confidential phone call. There are no cap limits for either civil or criminal defense. This covers all forms of self-defense. So from a fist to a firearm, from a fat lip to a dead body, you are covered and you will have some of the nation's most passionate 2A attorneys in your corner fighting for you. And right now, if you visit my friends at protectwithbear.com and you use the promo code WGL, you will receive 10% off. Listen, you need to protect yourself so that you can protect them. Visit my good friends at protectwithbear.com. Okay, the case that we're talking about today, Illinois, is Harold v. Raul. Now, we could be talking about any one of the cases because I can flat guarantee you that this memorandum will be filed across the board in all of the petitions currently kicking before the United States Supreme Court. Now, myself, as well as Mark over at Four Boxes Diner, we've always been a little concerned that this case, unlike the Maryland case, has not actually finished off. I mean, it has not come to a final resolution. It's not come to fruition. It still has some litigating to go. Now, we all know how this is going to come out, so we know what the inevitable conclusion will be, but we haven't quite reached it there. And the fact that this is considered to be midstream, or as lawyers like to call it, in an interlocutory phase, because we got to use fancier words than what we need to, um, that does, in fact, to some degree, weaken the ability to get one of these cases accepted by the United States Supreme Court. Not to fret, however, because the case in Maryland is complete and it is absolutely ripe for our acceptance. But that does not mean, Illinois, that one of these cases might not be consolidated. Now, what I want to do is I want to go through and just give you some of the highlights of what your attorney general is arguing, because if you don't dislike them now, you will after I'm done with this video. Now, just so you know, the brief itself is 36 pages in length, and of that 36 pages, the Illinois Attorney General spends about three or four of them actually trying to defend the law. The rest of the memorandum reads like a Stephen King horror novel of some of the things that maniacs have done with particular weapons. But from a procedural standpoint, the state of Illinois does raise a good issue about whether or not this is the right case to take on appeal. Reasons for denying the petition. The petition should be denied. This case is not cert worthy. There is no circuit split on the question presented and the interlocutory posture makes it a poor vehicle for resolving that question. And there is a little bit of truth to that because the Supreme Court typically will only accept cases after they have completely been litigated so that they can then operate from a fully developed record. As the state of Illinois also points out, this case does not satisfy the criteria for certiorari. There is no division of authority on the question presented. Certiorari is unwarranted because there is no conflict among federal courts of appeals or state courts of last resort on the question presented. 
And, and there is a little bit of truth that there is, in fact, no circuit split because what you see here is jurisdictions that readily support civilian disarmament. And, of course, if you challenge it to that state Supreme Court, hey, no harm, no foul. And then, of course, states that actually respect and preserve your inalienable rights, well, they don't even try this type of legislative shenanigans. That's why we don't have a division of authority. The interlocutory nature of the Seventh Circuit's decision makes this a poor vehicle to decide the question presented. And that would normally be the case if this was such a unique and novel issue. But let's face it, the battle over assault weapon bans has been ongoing for a number of years. There is a multitude of records we have heard from every single possible expert ad nauseum. We have seen every possible argument thrown out by both sides, the, those that are opposed to bans by relying on, you know, the Constitution and common sense and things like that. And then those who support these bans who've come up with all sorts of creative arguments out of thin air. But once again, the record here is already fully developed. The court should reject petitioner's request that it depart from the usual certiorari criteria. And again, as mentioned earlier, yes, that is typically how the Supreme Court does operate. So it is possible that we will see acceptance of an assault weapon ban. It may not just come out of the state of Illinois. Now, when we actually get to the merits of the argument, you guys forgot that there was actually merits to this argument. Well, Illinois, this is what your state has to say. The decision below is consistent with Heller and Bruin. Assault weapons and large capacity magazines are not arms protected by the Second Amendment. And you sit there and you go, oh my God, wow, I, I, I didn't realize that. I geek out on this channel, I geek out on a lot of other channels, I thought I knew my stuff pretty well. I could have sworn the Second Amendment did protect them and now Illinois is saying they don't. Why is that? Well, it's, it's again, it's a fictional legal theory because what they're saying is Heller and Bruin stands for the fact that you can't ban firearms which are in common use for self-defense. And the court here has found that assault weapons, as defined by Illinois law, are just not in common use or appropriate for self-defense. And therefore, they, as well as large capacity magazines, which are not needed for self-defense, is not protected by the plain text of the Second Amendment. That is actually the ruling of the court. They also have found that assault weapons are more appropriate for military use, that they are not defensive weapons, rather they are offensive weapons. And for that reason, the plain text of the Second Amendment does not protect it either. The challenge laws are consistent with historical tradition. And this is where we get to the Bowie knives and restricting drunkards from having firearms and gunpowder storage and the long, long list of nauseating laws that are apples to oranges that we've seen have been cited by Illinois and California and Washington State and New York and New Jersey and Maryland. Petitioner's arguments are not persuasive. On the contrary, the court made clear that the Second Amendment right to armed self-defense necessarily excludes firearms that do not further that right, such as weapons that are most useful in military service. Can someone please explain to me how weapons that are used to defend our country are not in furtherance of our constitutional rights? because that's exactly what the Seventh Circuit found. And again, we could do another 10 minutes on this memorandum, but you guys have all heard these ludicrous, fabricated, made up out of thin air arguments before. It's just a video that if I kept going on, you guys are either gonna need a barf bag or a stiff, stiff glass of bourbon. The case that we're talking about today is Harold v. Raul. We will go ahead and link up the Attorney General's opposition brief down there so that you can geek out on it for yourself. If you got any other questions about this or anything else related to what's left of our Second Amendment rights, you guys should know how to get a hold of Washington Gun Law by now. If you don't, that's okay. That information is down there in the description box. And then finally, let's everyone remember that part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here, is to know what the law is in every situation, how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe.